with one voice oh, we will sing every tribe and every tongue brings up harmony with one voice oh, we will bring heaven's beautiful melodies down to this earth as we morning. I'm excited for what God is doing already in this worship service. I'm excited for what happened this weekend with our ladies at the retreat. God is on the move and uh, we're excited for that. But today I want to continue in our, in our quarterly theme about praying longer and I want to talk about three dangerous prayers. I want to start out by, by making a statement. God has not called us to be safe. You know, a lot of times we think it's, in America, we want to be safe. We, we consider safety a priority for us. But God has not called us as Christians to be safe. In fact, God has created us, I think, to be dangerous. Now, we're dangerous on a couple of levels. I'm not talking about physically dangerous. <clears throat> I'm not talking about, you know, um, um, Chuck Norris kind of dangerous. Uh, <laughs> I'm not talking about that, but I am talking about spiritual danger in our prayers. We're spiritually dangerous when we pray on a couple of levels. First of all, because when we pray, we do great damage to the kingdom of God. We do great damage to the kingdom of, of evil, rather. <clears throat> and because of that, the enemy hates it when Christians pray. They absolutely hate Christians being on their knees. The movie that came out, Priscilla Shire was the <clears throat> was one of the was one of the stars of the of the movie. A movie that came out several years ago called War Room was all about spiritual warfare and how when we get on our knees and we pray, we do great harm to the kingdom of darkness. But there's another reason why sometimes our prayers are dangerous. Because if we get serious with God and we pray serious, dangerous prayers, something happens not only to the kingdom of darkness, but something happens within us as well. I don't know if you've ever thought about your prayers being dangerous or not. But that's what today's sermon is about, dangerous prayers. <clears throat> We're going to begin today by looking at a very dangerous prayer that David prayed, and it's found in Psalm 139. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, <clears throat> turn with, with me to Psalm 139. If you need a Bible, we have a rack of Bibles in the back. You're welcome to borrow one. We're going to begin reading verse 23. So as you're turning there, watch this short video. Heavenly Father, Father. As hard as this is for me, I am asking you to search me. Search me, God, and know my heart. God, test my motives. Reveal to me my anxious thoughts. Show me anything in me that offends you. God, I want to see in me what you see in me, so I can become more like Jesus. God, I ask you to search me. Search me. <clears throat> Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24 says this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So the idea here is that we're going to pray the prayer, search my heart. Search my heart. David prayed this prayer after his enemies were on the attack of accusing him for having the wrong motives. Has that ever happened to you? You're, you're trying to, to serve God and people accuse you of having an ulterior motive? Well, David begins this prayer by asking God to search his heart. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. 
Search me, O God, and know my heart. I think this is a very curious statement that David makes. <clears throat> Why would he ask God to search his heart? God's knowledge is perfect. He knows everything. Yes, he knows every thought you've ever thought. He reads your minds. He reads your thoughts. He knows what you're thinking. Those deepest, darkest secrets that you think you've hidden from everybody, God knows about it. God has perfect knowledge. So why would David say to God, search my heart as if maybe God missed something? <clears throat> but that's not what he's saying here. He, David had a reason to want God to search his heart. And, and I think this is the reason he knew that we really can't trust our hearts. He knows we cannot trust our hearts. The Bible makes it very clear in Jeremiah 17, 9. It says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And so we need to understand that without Christ, our heart is not a good heart. That we deceive others and we deceive ourselves. In fact, we're all liars. Now, how many of you in here are liars? Raise your hand. Okay. <clears throat> Keep them up. Come on. Keep them up. Keep them up for a second. I want you to look around. Everybody's hands not in the air. If there's somebody that doesn't have their hand in the air, just stare at them for a moment. Go ahead and say it. Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> because we're all liars. We all lie. You say, well, I don't lie to my spouse. I don't lie to my kids. I don't lie to my supervisor at work. I don't lie to my friends. But you lie to yourself all the time. We deceive ourselves, and we deceive others. And because of that, then we're liars. The most common lies are the ones that we tell ourselves. The heart is deceitful. We don't even know how bad we are. So, so a dangerous prayer like, search my heart, is, is dangerous because God is going to show you things that you're not going to be comfortable with. If you're really serious that and you're, and you're really serious about praying that prayer, God, search my heart, he's going to reveal some things to you that make you feel uncomfortable. He's going to reveal some things to you that you might be shocked and surprised at. <clears throat> our emotions fluctuate. Our understanding of things, the, the fact that we don't see the big picture. So that's why we're warned in Proverbs 3.5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That's why the Holy Spirit transforms you to become in the image of Jesus himself, which results in bringing you into deeper intimacy with God. So search my heart is a dangerous prayer, but it's one that can make you so much closer to God. When David prays this prayer and, and when we pray this prayer, search my heart, then we're asking God, to reveal, first of all, to reveal our fears. To reveal our fears. You see, he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. In the original language, there's a word that precedes the word thought. It's the Hebrew word serape, and it means anxious. So really what he says is, try me and know my anxious thoughts. Anxious is another word for worry. If we're anxious about something, it means we worry about it, okay? And, and it's those thoughts that we have about the things that we fear the most. And here is what I know about that. That what we fear the most is where we trust God the least. Where we fear the most is where we trust God the least. So David said, examine my heart. Show me where I'm lying to myself. Then he said, show me my greatest fears. Why? So that I can let go of them and put my trust in God. Then he says, in verse 24, uncover my sin. He says, uncover my sin. He said, see if there be any grievous way in me. Sometimes, sometimes, listen to this, sometimes we are completely oblivious to things that are so obvious to others with regard to our own lives. We may not see it, but people around us can see it. Say that. Has anybody ever tried to tell you something about yourself that you didn't believe existed? 
I can tell you that, that my wife of almost 44 years now tells me all the time stuff, and I go, I go, really? I, I, I just don't, I don't even realize it. I, it's things that, that I say or things that I do, and I don't even realize that I'm doing it. Has that ever happened to you? But I don't say, I don't call her a liar. I don't say, I don't think you're telling me the truth. I don't think I do that. But I think sometimes when people tell us things, we think to ourselves, I don't do that. That's not me. So maybe we need to, to, to listen to what others are trying to tell us. How about this? What things have, have you rationalized in your life over time? Come on. Every one of us has some things that we've rationalized. We know it exists in our lives. It isn't like it's oblivious to it. We know it exists in our lives, but we've kind of rationalized it away. You know? Every one of us does that. It's part of that deception to ourselves process. And so we need God to show us, to give us the stark reality of this, God. Uncover my sin. Let me see it for what it is. Here's another one. Where are you the most defensive? When people say something and you, and you, want, to, you want to defend your position, it's probably because you know that it's something you need to work on. And so we pray this prayer. It's a dangerous prayer. Lord, uh, search me. Then reveal my fears. Then uncover my sins. And finally, David says in this, in this very... Uh, Last part, he says, lead me, lead me. He says, lead me in the way everlasting. What he's saying there is put me on the right path. The path that I'm going on, I want to be going closer to who Jesus is in my life. But sometimes we get distracted and we get off. You know, we call those in life rabbit trails. Sometimes we just take a little bit of a detour from where God is wanting us to go. And so we need God to show us the, the, the path. Lead us in the way everlasting. Put us on the right path. But more than that, keep us off the path that leads to destruction. So the first, first dangerous prayer that we can pray is, God, search me. Here's the second dangerous prayer. God, I know you give grace to the humble. So I ask you, God, to do a deep work in my heart and break me. Break me of my pride. Break me of my selfishness. Break me of anything that keeps me from knowing you. As hard as it is to ask God, do whatever it takes to break me.
a story in the New Testament. It's found in the, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verse 3. And it's a story of a woman who came, well, we'll just read it. Mark 14, verse 3. It says, while well, Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at a table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. This flask of oil, this gift, represented her past. What do I mean by that? This flask of ointment at some point came into her possession, and, that, and that's significant because in her day, in that culture, women didn't, didn't own anything. And the fact that she owned this very expensive box or flask of ointment indicated that somebody had given this to her, and she was keeping it very close to her because it represented for her her security. Somebody in the past had given this to her. Maybe she inherited it. Somehow she, it came into her possession. And so it was very valuable. And so it represented something from the past to her. But it also, I think, represented her future. It represented her future. Women in this time had no rights and they had very little social safety nets. For this reason, her giving up this flask of oil was giving, like giving up her social security, and it was a huge sacrifice. I want us to think about this, and I've heard this particular, this passage of verse preached before, but I want us to kind of twist it a little bit and think of it a little differently. I want you to think about this flask of oil as your own life, your own life. Let me explain. Our lives contain something valuable to the kingdom of God. Every one of us has a purpose. Nobody is here by accident. Everybody has a purpose for being here, and everybody has a reason for your existence because you have a purpose. You have something valuable to offer the kingdom of God. But the value is only potential value until, like this flask, we're broken. Yes. As long as it's in the flask, it may be an expensive, it may be valuable, but it has no earthly good. Absolutely no earthly good while it's retained in this body we call the flask. It's only until the flask is broken and that gift then is useful to the kingdom of God. In fact, things that we consider valuable in our society lose their value once they're broken and simply are discarded. In God's economy, we're not valuable until we're broken. So we need to learn to put aside our pride and humble ourselves before the Lord, and then and only then do we become a value to God and His kingdom. That's why this is such a dangerous prayer, because it's setting ourselves aside and allowing God do a work in us. Here's something I know. We might impress people with our strengths, but we connect with people through our weaknesses. We might impress people with our strength, but we connect with people through our weaknesses. So what has to happen for us to be broken? Well, there's an Old Testament verse that I think gives us some direction in this area. 2 Chronicles 7.14, you know it. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Listen, the reason that, the reason that, that we're not valuable to the kingdom of God is because we've allowed pride to keep that value that's within us contained within us. It's like the flash that's unbroken. Our pride keeps that from coming out. But the minute that we allow our, our, ourselves to be broken, to humble ourselves before God, then we become valuable to the kingdom of God. So the second dangerous prayer is, Lord, break me. Lord, 
search me. And then, Lord, break me. Here's the third. God, I've been comfortable for way too long. Please, forgive me. I know you want to use me to show your love in this world. Give me eyes to see needs of others and a heart that dares to get involved where you are working. God, my life is yours. Whatever you want, wherever you need, here I am, Lord. Send me. somebody else. It's in Exodus chapter 3. God said to him, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? What he's saying in essence is, you got the wrong person. you got the wrong guy. Send somebody else. That's somebody else's responsibility. That's somebody else's job. Listen, you need to understand something. If God has called you to do something, if God has clearly spoken to you through his word, through the testimony of others, maybe the pastor has come to you and, and said, would you consider this? And God has confirmed that in your life, and you still say, no, you need to get somebody else. That is also, by the way, also Moses did end up doing what God called him to do. There's a lesson here. Jonah ended up doing what God called him to do. Moses ended up doing what God called him to do. But he didn't, neither one of these men immediately said, here I am, send me. They, they came up with excuses. Why they couldn't serve. Why they wouldn't serve. So, that's why this prayer, here I am, send me, is so, so 
so dangerous. Because if we really mean that, then you need to be ready to pack your bags and go if God tells you to go. It might be to go across the street and speak to that person that's been living there for 15 years and you've never shared the gospel with them. It might be for you to go to a co-worker that you've been working alongside of as a, as a Christian incognito. They didn't even know you were a Christian. And to, and to be bold enough to speak the truth in love, to share the good news of Jesus Christ with that person. Don't be like Moses to say, here I am, send somebody else. Here's one other thing I want to say about that before we go to the third example. God, you say, I'm not qualified. I can't, I'm not qualified to do that. Listen, God doesn't call the qualified. He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. If he's called you, then he's going to equip you. He's going to give you everything that you need to do what he has called you to do. You don't even have to worry about that. Listen, when God called me to the ministry, I pulled a Jonah. I wanted to prove to God that I was not the guy that he had made a terrible mistake. And I ran. I did a Jonah. I pulled a Jonah. I ran. I wanted to prove to God that he had totally botched it on this one. And for nine months, I acted like a person that wasn't even a Christian. I was going to prove to God that he was wrong. And I will tell you that that was just as bad as what Jonah went through in nine months. It was a terrible time in my life, running from what I knew God had called me to do. So don't be like Jonah, and don't be like Moses. Instead, be like Isaiah. Isaiah said, here I am. Send me. It's found in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. This is Isaiah's testimony. He said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. Listen, brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to know that if God is calling us, we need to be ready to move. We need to be ready to go. But we live our lives in such a way that we've encumbered ourselves so that we are not able to get up and move. We have, you know, if you had to move tomorrow to go to another city to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, you couldn't pick up and go because there's too much, you have too much stuff. You have too much stuff. You can't just leave. Now, I, I'm not saying that you need to sell everything and live out of a tent so that when it's time to go, you can just, you know, fold the tent and put it in your car and go. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is live your life in such a way that if God calls you and gives you an opportunity to serve him, that you're able to do that. Most of us are encumbered with stuff, but more than that, many of us are encumbered with debt. So that if we had an opportunity to go, we couldn't go because we couldn't afford it. We couldn't go because we have too many, too many obligations here in this place in this day today that we couldn't get up and go. And we are bound by those things and prevented from being able to say, here I am, send me. So what do you need to do then to fully surrender to God? What do you need to do to be able to pray that third dangerous prayer? Here I am, Lord, send me. I will go where you want me to go. I will do what you want me to do. I will stay for as long as you need me to stay. I will serve you faithfully. What is it you want me to do, God? I'm ready. I'm ready to say yes to you. Well, I can tell you that what, what preceded Isaiah's ability to say that was a direct encounter, an experience with the, in the very presence of God. First of all, we've got to get to that place. We've got to experience the very presence of God. If you read earlier in the sixth chapter of the book of Isaiah, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. If you go on to read, it talked about some seraphim. Those are angels, and they're flying from pillar to post in this temple, and they're crying out, holy, 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 and, and the place is filled with smoke, and the place is, 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 is shaking with the sound of their voices. And then they take a live coal off of the altar, and he says, I am a man of unclean lips, and I come from a people of unclean lips. He took a coal. 
coal off the altar and touched his lips. And that's what he was able to say. Here I am. Send me. Listen, we've got to have a real encounter with Jesus. Jesus, yeah, he can't that. use you if you're just a marginal Christian. He can't use you if you're just a Sunday only, one hour or an hour and a half on Sunday Christian. He cannot use you. You've got to be sold out, lock, stock, and barrel. You've got to say, God, whatever I have is yours. Whatever, wherever it is you want me to go, whatever it is, it's all yours. It all belongs to you, God. We sing that song, it all belongs to you, God. It all belongs. Because we've got our arms, we, we don't have our arms out saying, God, what is it you want me to go? Give it, give me the assignment, I'm ready, because we've got our arms around our stuff. We, our hands are full of the world. We can't receive anything from God at all. So we've got to have a genuine experience with the presence of God. We also have to have a genuine awareness of our sinfulness. Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips. He acknowledged his sin. He didn't try to hide his sin. He didn't try to cover it up. He didn't try to make himself look perfect. We need to have a genuine awareness of our sinfulness. And then we need to have a genuine, gen, a genuine understanding of the grace of God to cover that sin. So brothers and sisters, that's how you get qualified. Ladies, that's how you get your credentials. You learn that this weekend. Renee told me, she shared that with me earlier. She said, don't you use that on Wednesday night now. <laughs> that's how you get your credentials. That's how you, that's how you can be a card-carrying Christian. To be able to be ready to go and do what God has called you to do. That's a dangerous prayer, God. Here I am, send me. Because if you're really serious, God's going to do it. So don't pray that prayer unless you're serious. God, do whatever it takes. Another dangerous prayer. Do whatever it takes to get me to the place that I'm ready to do what you want me to do. So three dangerous prayers. Lord, search me. Show me who I really am. Because I've... I've I've managed to fool myself for a lot of years. I've, I've lied to myself so much that I, be, that I believe the lies. And then break me, Lord. Get rid of my pride. Get rid of all of those things that stand in the way of me being valuable to the kingdom of God. Break me like that flask of oil was broken in order to anoint the head of Jesus. And then, Lord, send me. Send me. And when we pray those dangerous prayers, God is going to move. And we're going to be a danger to, to the kingdom of darkness, but more than that, it's going to change us and make us who God wants us to be. One more